generations of gay and lesbian Americans can barely relate to the discrimination and often threatening environment uh, you faced as a lesbian uh, before the 1980s. And explain to the next generation the arc of acceptance that you've seen in your lifetime. So mm -hmm. from the beginning of your coming out experience till now. Thea and I met in 65 and by 60, in 63, by 65 we were dating Okay, and by 67 we became engaged. And we were affluent, okay, we both had good jobs, good money coming in, and we didn't feel it much. Okay, we looked good, okay. Our neighbors were all straight, but, the, but they liked us, you know. Uh, so, so I missed a lot of the pain. Uh, I think back to IBM, though, where we were a bastard group. IBM was just doing its first mainframes, we had this floor in the Time Life building, and we all really liked each other a lot. So we had drinks together, we had lunch together, we met after work, okay? And, except I never went, uh, spent weekends with them, okay? okay? And years later, you had to years later, I'm sitting across from somebody who said, Yo, Edie, how come you never came to the wine tastings? Which they did every weekend or something, okay? Right. You know, and I said, because I was queer. Because <laughs> okay. you had to keep it totally under wraps. Right, all the time, and really to good friends. Yeah. So when, when, when it came out in the New York Times, okay. <laughs> what a way to come everybody, out. Everybody, everybody's <laughs> calling me up and saying, Edie, you lied. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thea was around a lot, and I said, oh, I was you know, having an affair with Thea's brother. Okay, Willie. Willie is a doll with Thea's doll who still lives in my closet. Oh, how <laughs> funny! <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that he's in the closet, that's yeah. hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> how did you get through those early times when life was like with little because, or no acceptance? Oh, I have one great, one great getting through. I wanted to go to get a degree, a master's degree in math. So I go to NYU, and all I want is a job as a secretary because they pay your tuition. Oh, okay. I see, okay. okay. Finally, they refused me. I came back the next day. And so the woman said, well, across the street is the Math Institute. They have a lot of subsidies from the uh, AEC, okay, and, uh, and we can get, a, get you a better salary there. I mean, Robbie, it's Robbie who taught me that, in fact, it was illegal for them to have gay people working, right, in a place with, with big government contracts. But I never knew that. All I know is we did need Q clearance, which was very high. And I get a letter from the FBI inviting me to a hearing. And it says, you don't need a lawyer at this time, but you will be allowed such if you need it. And that go, always scares you. And <laughs> so, and it was a book by a guy named Corey. He had an appendix which had what the law was in every state. That is, what you could be arrested for in every state. And for women, it just said, if you're imitating a man. And then in the bars at that time, people used to say, at least two pieces of female, female underwear. Female clothing, underwear. Yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. And then, and they can't arrest you. So I say, okay, that's, okay, I can manage that. I went, I wore crinolines and <laughs> high heel and high heel shoes, which I did a lot anyhow, okay. Right, right. But I was especially dressed for the, for the hearing, no right, question. Right. And I thought, if they ask me, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to tell the truth, but at least I know I'm not going to jail. Right. I might lose my job. Right. Okay, but I'm not going to jail. And they keep questioning me about some guy. And I said, I think I met him in my mother's house. I, I, I don't know. I know he was a substitute teacher once at my junior high. I think he was a friend of my sister's, maybe. What's your relationship with your sister? Go on and on and on. Never I said anything about gay. Okay. I get out of there and I went to a payphone, okay? I called my sister and I said, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, he was, he was some big deal in the teachers' union and he got us on a list of, you know, people willing to, to help with whatever he was doing. So you got through so, it all and nobody ever yeah. questioned your no, sexuality no, never, or any of that never, stuff? Never, never. Oh, so that was never, great. Yeah. How, well, how was your relationship? How was your relationship with Thea? I was wild about her from the first time I met her. Okay. And she Good was choice. always with someone. And we <laughs> danced together the first night we met. And, uh, and I danced a hole in my stocking. I was very you famous for it, <laughs> right? Okay. But then, she, you know, she had a lover who was coming home. So that was the end of the dancing. I, I decided to go home. Okay. From there on in, though, I went to a lot of lesbian parties. I kept meeting people. And, uh, and if Thea was there, we would dance together. People would have their coats on waiting at the door. And, and Thea would say, you know, her, her current lover 
and my date would be there furious while we're da we have to finish dancing before we... Okay. Okay. 1965, I was in therapy. I had decided that if you don't meet somebody when you're an undergraduate, forget it. You don't have a chance in hell oh. of meeting a woman. <laughs> There's no way to meet people except in the bars. So mm -hmm. My first experience in a bar, I, went, I was at a wedding in New York. I was dressed for a wedding. I come downtown on the Fifth Avenue bus, used to come right down to the square and go up again. And I, I stop a woman in a trench coat and I say, could you tell me, do you know where the, where the women go? Bars where only women go. And she pointed to a place called Hell's, <laughs> and I went there, and I sat at that bar. I had never paid for my own drink before. I bought a drink, and I sat at that bar, and nobody talked to me, and I didn't talk to anybody, and I sat there for two hours, and then I left. Okay. okay. So, I mean, it, it was really rough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm in, but, okay, but I'm in Serbia, and I thought, if I could meet a guy with kids who need a mother, you have to remember, it was still a world of Freudians and, you know, and there was nowhere for me to go. And I didn't want to, my, my feeling was I didn't want to live a life without love. Right. Okay. And uh, so if somebody needs a mother, okay, I could do that. Okay. okay. And then I heard that Thea had, was, had broken up with somebody. And so I'm going to the Hamptons. I know she had a place in the Hamptons. And I call up people I barely knew. <laughs> and I said, you know, I know it's presumptuous. Okay, could I come for the weekend? And they said, yeah. <laughs> okay. So Just off I went. <laughs> and then I knew we would run into each other somehow. Oh, and, so uh, you pursued her uh, actively. Yeah. Oh, I, boy, did I ever. Okay. <laughs> later, much later, okay, like, a year before she died, she said, honey, we're a bit so lucky. You know, we're still so in love all this time. And I said, no, you were lucky and I was persistent. <laughs> so what was your reaction when you were first served the, uh, the estate tax bill after Thea passed away? Well, a couple of things. One, 